Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are joining us from today. My name is Peter Counter. I am the managing editor of Fine Biometrics and Mobile ID World, and I'm very pleased to welcome you to True Identity, the biometric government of tomorrow. Fine Biometrics is expert webinar and the conclusion of Government Biometrics Month presented in association with FedID. All through September, the Fine Biometrics content team has placed a specific special focus on the government, cent uh, the government sector in our news, featured articles, and events coverage. Our head writer, Alex Perala, explored the state of biometric border control and took a deep dive on how the government is pushing the state of the art in biometrics while Susan Stover, our director of digital media, and myself, we reported live from FedID in Tampa, the US government's key biometrics conference. Our written thought pieces, audio interviews with biometrics executives, and photos covering FedID can be found on findbiometrics.com and our social media accounts, which all share the same handle, at findbiometrics. Today's webinar is sponsored by Iris ID and NEC Corporation of America. It will last a total of 45 minutes and will conclude with a short question and answer period at the end. We have hundreds of people in attendance today, so I encourage you all to submit your questions while the discussion is happening using the dialog box on your go-to control panel. Uh, that will give us time to sort through all of your questions and make sure we address as many topics as possible. Today's panel is going to cover a wide range of topics, from law enforcement to privacy concerns to the effect that consumer technology has had on the government sector, uh, specifically referring to biometrics. Uh, but we're going to start today's presentation on the topic of border control, which in 2018 has become the most actively visible space in government biometrics. And to set the stage with industry-leading research, I'm excited to introduce Maxine Most, Principal of Acuity Market Intelligence. I've known Max for over five years now. We met right after Apple's Touch ID announcement in 2013 at the Fed ID conference, which back then uh, was known as the Biometrics Consortium Conference. And even then, I'd already known her from my uh, previous career as a more broad technology reporter. Uh, I knew her from her research having famously predicted the mobile biometrics revolution that was just starting out at that time. Uh, since then, Acuity's reports have become my own gold standard in terms of industry forecasting uh, whenever I want to understand the big trends in biometrics and identity, whether it's mobility, cloud-based authentication, or like today, border control, Max has the best numbers. So here today to discuss a major transformation underway in airport automation, is Maxine Most. Take it away, Max. Thanks, Peter, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everybody. I'm happy to be here, and I'm just going to give you guys a bit of a quick uh, insight into some of the uh, latest research cuties uh, produced on you know, automated biometric facilitation in airports. Uh, and since the theme today is true identity, that's what we're uh, we're going to talk about. Uh, as Peter told you, you know, I've been at this for a while. We've known each other, you know, personally for five years, but I've been in the industry for almost 20 years. Those of you that don't know me and know Acuity, and we really cover the biometrics market, I think, in, a, in an in-depth way that, that no one else really in the market does. There's a lot of people out there now because it's gotten very crowded, but I... If you don't know about Acuity, I encourage you to come and visit the website and take a look for yourself. Okay, that's the PR. Now let's get into the to the information. Do you want to go to the next slide, Peter? Okay, so what's driving airport biometric facilitation? I don't think this is news to anybody, right? One of the, obviously one of the biggest issues is improved immigration management and tracking. But other things that we're seeing that's that are actually changing the dynamics of the market is really the maturation of of biometric solutions, the fact that consumers now worldwide are both familiar with biometrics because more than three billion of, the, of us have them on our mobile phones, but people have also accepted biometrics as part of sort of a daily experience. And I think that really has changed the way that the airports and airlines look at biometrics 
Um, this is no longer just coming from an immigration perspective. And we're also, you know, security checks are constantly evolving and getting more onerous and disruptive. And really, I think what's fundamentally changed in a really interesting way, and again, this goes back to mobility, is that you have airlines and, and airports that are now looking at biometrics as a means of inc improving service, um, addressing time constraints within the airport environment, and depending on your perspective, either reducing costs or potentially uh, improving revenue streams. And for airports, what that means is getting people through the choke points quicker so they can spend money uh, in the retail environment in the airport. Okay, Peter, next, please. And and again, what's, what's really driving this, whoops, uh, is it possible to go back just for a second, is that convergence of um, government, commercial, and sort of citizen and consumer preferences and priorities all of these things have now uh basically become um simpatico again going back to the mobile devices okay next slide and so along with these drivers we have a whole series of challenges um one of the big ones and you can just go ahead and hit these peter and hopefully they'll come up um biometric interoperability right we're, we're, there's what we're trying to do now is to create a universal experience across the globe in terms of how biometric facilitation works and cross genuine cross-border exchange so that as people are moving through their travel experience they're seeing similar they're having similar experiences and they're seeing similar things and, and every airport is now not a new investigation of okay how do i get through this airport? How do I minimize my journey time? How do I do this in a way that's easiest for me? And how do I use the technology that's available to me to do so? And do I have to sign up for six programs? And do I have to learn all these different interfaces? So there's a lot going on now around trying, you know, there's a lot of technology being deployed, but there's also the context of how do we start to do this in a way that makes sense globally? And moving from this perspective of minimizing the impact of choke points to eventually removing choke points altogether. How do you eliminate choke points? How do you create what people are referring to as a frictionless curve to gate environment utilizing biometric technology? And, and along the lines, again, you have interoperability issues, there's no universal biometric, and every facility has their own specific infrastructure constraints. So that's the milieu, if you will, of what's driving and what's constraining the evolution of this um, marketplace. And, and um, go ahead, Peter. <clears throat> and so this is kind of a diagram that Acuity developed, and I still think it's workable in terms of understanding what this curb to gate experience looks like and where the choke points are. And one of the things that I believe, if you can go ahead and just click the next um, button, one of the things, and one more, Peter, one of the things that I believe is that that, and this is not necessarily being done yet, but I think one of the ways to actually address this problem most effectively and really address a lot of the, the security concerns and the privacy concerns, um, there's been a lot of push towards face and linking that toward the credential. I think there's an opportunity to use a temporary biometric as a means of moving through the airport. I'm not convinced that we necessarily want this entire system to be cloud-based in terms of referencing original documents, credentials, i.e. our e-passports or the photos on file with them. And I know that's the approach right now, for example, that CBP is taking in the U.S. airports. But I think there's a model that allows us to move through this process that really calls for a temporary biometric. So as you're, you know, trying to get through departure, there's a number of checks, a number of choke points. As those evolve to less constrained choke points, um, we'll see more, a more frictionless experience but again i think there's an opportunity for a temporary biometric and you could actually issue that as people come into the airport um and then um revoke it as they board an airplane or in the, in the case of the next slide um you could actually uh, go ahead and click one more time you could actually um hold on to that temporary biometric biometric through arrival at the next destination. But this, again, goes back to this concept of cross-border agreements and um, interoperability, right? We have to create a system that transcends just an individual border agency's try trying to solve their problem. So as much as we're seeing a lot of innovation right now and a lot of uh, programs 
um, and a lot of excitement, certainly driven by what's going on in the United States, there's still a lot of constraints in terms of really making this thing work on a global scale. Okay, and now I'm going to um, share some numbers with you because people always like numbers and I like numbers and, and I got into actually, when I first started this business, we really weren't doing a lot of market research, but people kept calling me up and asking me for numbers because so many of the numbers out there seemed sort of um, ridiculous. And so uh, I work really hard to do what I call bottom up uh, market analysis. And that means counting things and, and reflecting market growth based on things that we can actually count, um, like the actual number of e-gates and APC kiosks and boarding gates that are out there. And so this kind of gives you a global view. This is all the biometric automation. Now, when we're, we're talking about what's going on with CBP, it's kind of tricky because I don't necessarily consider what they're doing with face pods automation. To me, putting a face pod up at a gate that you have a CBP officer in doesn't really qualify as the kind of automation I'm talking about. Really, we're talking about e-gates. We're talking about APC kiosks. We're talking about boarding gates where you manage the whole process yourself. So when I really talk about automated facilitation, I'm talking about the pro part of the process that you can interact with the technology without that being facilitated by uh, a security person or, you know, a TSA rep or a, a CBP officer or a border patrol person. So you, this is the growth we have projected in terms of overall total units across the board. It's not necessarily as big as everybody always thinks. But again, this is based on the count that we have today, the, the kind of growth we're expecting, and looking at how many air, actual airports there are in the world and how many boarding gates there are in the world and going through that sort of in a bottom-up way. So this gives you like total units over the next five years. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. And this is associated revenues with that. Again, um, oh, that looks a little funny. I don't know why that slide looks funny to me. Um, okay, it's a revenue slide, but so so we're talking about, you know, getting to upwards of sustainable, you know, starting to approach half a billion dollars a year. What's interesting about the revenue side of this is obviously as the technology has um, advanced, we see price performance curves drop. So we're seeing better technology to lower cost. When I first did this analysis, we were looking at between 350000 dollars a unit all inclusive for an e-gate upwards of a million because of the infrastructure investment that was being made now those costs have come down we're looking at e-gates when we're doing these projections fully loaded in the neighborhood of 100 to 220 thousand dollars per unit so yeah we're seeing increased deployments but we're also seeing a significant drop in um the cost of these units going forward and when we do these projections you're sort of building in um a projected cost drop over time that may or may not reflect reality. Obviously, we do the best we can. Okay, next slide. Um, this one gives you an idea of sort of the um, breakdown by the type of uh, unit. And again, I, I, I'm sorry, these slides are a little, for some reason, look a little funny, and I don't know why. Um, the vast majority of units in the market today are APC kiosks, which is interesting. And there have been some recent um, statements by CBP that they want to get rid of all the APC kios kiosks as well as the global entry kiosks. I think they're sort of getting ahead of their skis on that. We can talk about that a little later. But this kind of gives you an idea in terms of um, if you look at where we're going to be in 2022, the breakdown of the market in terms of overall total number of units. Okay, next slide. And, um, oh my God, this... I don't know why this is it's showing up kind of funny for me and I, I hope you guys are seeing this a little better than I can. Um, this guy gives you an idea of what the total addressable market is and where we're going to be um, at 2020 in 2022 in terms of overall penetration. If people are having trouble reading these, you know, I'm happy to, to send the slides out so um, you can get a better sense. And again, it just kind of gives you an idea of where the opportunities are going to be going forward in the market. Obviously, you know, ABC kiosks are the global entry kiosks, and there are similar type programs in a couple places. Mexico's adopted that approach. So the reason why you're seeing such high rates of penetration is that's sort of a North America, U.S., North American kind of unique solution. So we, there isn't a huge opportunity to spread those across the globe. So we kind of see really high penetration rates on that. Or some of the other technologies, we see much lower penetration rates because we're just starting to see these solutions emerge in the marketplace, and it takes time to roll this out globally. Okay, next slide. 
Um, and this gives you an idea of um, how, if you're looking at the total number of units deployed across all the different types of units, where the biggest hits are regionally. And it's not a surprise. Um, part of the reason North America is so big in this, uh, has, has such a big percentage of the overall total number of units is because of the APC deployments, which have gone crazy in the last couple of years. And there's, we're, I think we're approaching 3,000 of those um, globally. The vast majority are in the U.S. So that's really why this is, gets a little bit distorted, particularly when you look at the revenues associated with them, because those are much lower cost solutions. But this is not really, I think, a surprise to anybody. Europe's invested heavily in this infrastructure. Um, you know, there are more e-gates in Europe than any place else. There's Asia certainly has um been increasing the use of this technology and and probably just outside the the uh range of this projection 2022 you'll start to see asia move into that dominant position and that it, it, over the forecast period that happens you'll is a shift essentially from europe to asia okay next slide and this just gives shows you the revenue share um hmm. I don't, I'm, I, again, apologize. These slides are coming up a little bit funny to me, and I don't know why the, uh, um, that's happening. But again, I, this, this is the, the, the uh, com companion chart where you're seeing basically um, Europe is still kind of dominating with, the, with the, the revenues, and this is total revenue share between 2018 and 2022. And again, um, Asia's in, in second place, North America is close behind in third, but again, this will shift pretty dramatically outside the window of this forecast period, particularly as, as India, which is essentially a green field opportunity, starts coming online. And they've already made some commitments to, to um, biometric airport automation uh, in the next couple of years. They just made a, a significant announcement uh, for one of their airports, and, and it's going to spread fairly rapidly once they come online. Uh, okay, next slide. Okay, so that's that's just my overview. If you're interested in getting more data, Acuity has tons of data. We have a, a pretty complete spreadsheets. Um, as far as I know, on eGates and APC kiosks, we work really hard to keep those up to date. So if you're interested in looking at global deployments, we have those. Um, you can go ahead and click through, Peter. And then we also have a report we've just released, which is the um, new version of what was our automated border control report, which we're now calling airport automated biometric facilitation, because we've just seen a, um, a real shift in the market sort of from the complete focus on immigration really to this notion of biometric facilitation through the environment. So uh, there's previews of that and uh, tons of data globally, regionally, uh, by different type of um, technology. And as always, go ahead, Peter, you can hit it again. I'm available. Reach out to me. Uh, visit the website. Follow me on, on Twitter. I, I provide my uh, comments on, on sort of what's going on on a daily basis as these announcements come up. And uh, yeah, thank you for listening. Thanks for the time. And I'm looking forward to the discussion with my uh, esteemed colleagues. Thanks so much, Max. Uh, you know, even with those like small technical difficulties it's really fascinating transformation that's that's undergoing here and it's it's happening so rapidly so thanks for giving us some uh, data on that it's my pleasure now to introduce the rest of our webinar panel um tim meyeroff director at iris id and benji hutchinson vice president of federal operations at nec corporation of america uh, panelists thank you for joining me today um, so let's jump right into some questions about border control, and then we're going to uh, branch out from there. So first question, um, one of the reasons that border control is so visible right now is because of the biometric uh, entry exit trials that are underway at American airports. Longtime uh, industry veterans, readers of fine biometrics, they'll all know this recent activity is the product of intense lobbying on behalf of industry organizations and advocates. Um, and the question here is, what were the main obstacles facing the biometric entry exit program in the United States, and how were they overcome? Uh, Tim, can you start us off on this one, please? Well, uh, thanks for the introduction, Peter. Um, You're I think one of the major obstacles uh, with the air exit in particular uh, was physical space in the airport. 
and coordinating uh, government activity along with the airlines and the airports, uh, that certainly was a significant challenge. Uh, you know, for the last three or four years with some other pilots that were done, uh, which was before the most recent wave of uh, face on air exit, you know, those pilots that are underway right now. But it was those three uh, entities uh, coordinating the activity uh, to figure out who's going to pay for what and where's it going to go and how's it going to work and maintenance and a lot of other factors in there. Great. And uh, Benji, can I get you to weigh in on this one, please? Sure, absolutely, Peter. And thank you for having me. I see a number of items that uh, that that were troubling this. As we all know, this technology was was a mandate, unfunded after 9/11, and for for years, almost a decade, um, there was a debate among the stakeholders about who was going to pay for it. Like Tim said, and how much space would it occupy in airports, an aging infrastructure, um, and and what would it take to get it done. But I think the three major things that changed were the maturity of the technology, the price of the technology, and public perception. Those are the three things that we see quite a bit uh, when we deploy some of the technology to the airports today. I think, you know, as, as Max pointed out, the maturity of the technology has come such a far away uh, from the days of stop and stare, where it took a little bit longer, you know, maybe six seconds, 10 seconds to match a face. Nowadays, with face recognition, it's less than two seconds for the current deployments and biometric exit, and that's a huge advancement. And then second, price and cost. You know, in the late 2000s, and uh, last decade, people were going up to Capitol Hill and testifying that it would cost $6 billion to implement a full biometric entry and exit system across the United States. That's a big number. Now, that did include labor, and it included changes to the infrastructure and things that do drive up cost, but a significant portion of that cost was the biometric technology, and that's just not the case today. 10 or 15 years later, after those types of testimonies, we've seen the cost has dropped dramatically. And then finally, the third thing is public perception. Uh, as, as, as Max pointed out, and, and I think you pointed out in your intro, um, you know, over the past seven, eight years, we've seen a dramatic shift in, in acceptance of this technology and wide adoption. Um, we've got more and more travelers. Uh, that are, are are wanting a better, more seamless, frictionless experience in their passenger journey, and they're just more apt to accept the technology. Great. And Max, can I get your your take on this? Well, I think these guys have kind of summarized it, and uh, you know, again, what I what I was talking about earlier, these challenges and and kind of shifts in the market dynamics. I still think I, I think it's really interesting. I mean, I know there's a lot of excitement and hype around entry and, and exit, but I think, you know, what I think is interesting about the U.S. is that in some way they're trying to kind of leapfrog what's going on in the rest of the world. You know, we've seen, you know, for example, um, you know, the U.S. is trying to go purely, to you know, um, tokenless or single, uh, I shouldn't say tokenless, but single biometric token, you know, network-based token as opposed to linking um, a biometric to a credential. And so, you know, I think some of it, you know, is, as Ben, you said, is perception and people's willingness to do it. But I also think to some extent, you know, the, there's still there's still some challenges because we're, there was an OIG report that just came out that said there's there's some issues with how well, how effectively the technology is working today. And so I think one of the things that the U.S. kind of has in particular, which is they sort of try to do their own kind of go their own way and do something that's really different than what's being done in the rest of the world. And so I think in some respects the u.s is is has an ongoing challenge in trying to uh build a a uh, credentialist system from scratch whereas australia is starting to do that now they're trying to go you know get away from using the passport and simply use the biometric but they have a you know 15 year history almost a 20 year history now of our 10 year history um actively in a 15 year history if you go back to testing of going through this process incrementally. So I think that's another thing that's kind of interesting with the US is that they're sort of trying to build something from scratch without necessarily leveraging best practices and what's worked effectively in other places. And and Benji's right, there are constraints. And this is this is one of the issues the US airports have always had is that our airports were, are primarily designed to be domestic, not international. And so some of the some of the choke points that they need don't exist in in a way that works 
for airport flow, whereas international airports are set up um, to balance choke points with flow. So I think that's another issue too in sort of the way the U.S. is approaching it. So I think it's going to be interesting to see how this all pans out. Right, excellent. Yeah, and uh, sort of going off of that international idea, you know, the biometric exit entry in, in the United States is very young right now. What are some exemplary biometric border initiatives that are happening around the world and what can this program learn from them? Um, I'll throw it back to you, Benji. Sure, I think Max touched on some of it. That the, That's a very interesting point she raises about the U.S. airports originally being designed for domestic travel. When you look at other markets like Europe or Asia, that's not the case. A lot of their infrastructure was primarily designed to uh, to, to facilitate international travel, or they're just built uh, more recently. So they're larger, they have different structures and different um, layouts that accommodate larger volumes of, of traffic of passengers. And so, and they are more internationally focused. So, so what does that mean? Well, I know, you know, from our own experience at NEC, one of the things we've seen with large deployments, such, such as places like Singapore or um, Hong Kong or Macau, uh, or even in Tokyo, you do see uh, larger automated footprints of gates uh, where where there's there's higher throughput and higher volume, and so um, there is a whole host of things that that the U.S. market could learn from what they're doing. Right, so you see a lot more passengers moving through more effectively, more efficiently. Um, there's a lot more trust in the technology. Um, and so the metrics bear it out. And uh, when you start seeing growth rates like we're going to see in the next five years, you're going to see an acceleration of the adoption of the technology and the performance and the accuracy. And so we're going to start to see, we're going to start to learn some of those lessons in this market as well. Great. And uh, Tim, uh, what about you? Do you have any uh, examples of biometric border control from around the world that could be? Well, exemplary? we've had a number. Yeah, we've had a number of programs running for more than 10 years. Uh, certainly Nexus Air uh, doesn't have that, that high volume, really, that uh, Benji was referring to. Uh, we've uh, also been running programs for a long time in the Middle East um, that are full border control, you know, e-gate and or immigration type of uh, application, uh, there is, you know, a tendency now that we see, like Benji mentioned, this frictionless high speed, and uh, Max touched on the tokenless. I'm not sure if we're 100% ready to go there. Uh, the U.S. market, uh, you know, is quite different than the rest of the world. Uh, because of the configuration of our airports. So really it remains to be seen uh, in the near term uh, how this works, you know, uh, accuracy rates are of a concern right now. Uh, and then we've seen some movement uh, just recently with the U.S. government uh, because we really don't have a solid standard for quality assessment for face, you know, as a metric. Uh, so some of that stuff uh, uh, really needs to be uh, fleshed out, you know, in the next year or two. Okay, I'm gonna uh, take a pivot into the law enforcement market. Um, and, you know, over, there's been a lot of uh, controversy over law enforcement uh, in the history of biometrics, but um, the commercial sector seems to be having an influence on public perception. Uh, my question is, how else is the commercial sector influencing how biometrics are used and accepted in law enforcement? And I'm going to throw this one to you, Max, to start off. Well, I would just say generally, you know, one of the biggest challenges that biometrics had initially when it was trying to jump from law enforcement to commercial applications, even civil applications to some extent, was this association with criminality. Your fingerprints, taking fingerprints are for identifying criminals. And so I think that, that perception has blown up now. 
Um, and it's blown up partially because we moved through a, uh, the arena of border control where people kind of got used to this. And now, of course, it's on everybody's phone. So I think that has fundamentally changed. And what's happening is we're starting to see the quality of technology. And, and, and you know, Benji and Tim have kind of alluded to this, too, is, you know, we're seeing this evolution in technology. We're seeing the evolution of technology on mobile devices. And that's feeding back in to the law enforcement arena where traditionally, particularly if you were talking about using technology in the field as opposed to, you know, um, fixed fingerprint systems in an office, uh, a, a law enforcement office location or in a, in, a, a in a prison environment, what we're now seeing is that the capabilities that are off the shelf on mobile phones have gotten to the point where that technology is being fed back into law enforcement. So I think the big shift is that we're starting to see the ability to use off the shelf commercial devices. And they're not there obviously 100% yet, but I think we're gonna see APHIS quality fingerprint capture on our mobile phones in the next several years. We're already seeing under glass, we're seeing a move from, from capacitive to optical in that world. And I think that could be a potential serious game changer because then you're talking about getting that capability. Everyone's out into the field and devices that everybody has anyway. And Benji, can I get you to weigh in on this, please? Sure. It, 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 it's actually a little miraculous if you think about it that facial recognition hasn't taken off uh, as, as quickly or as rapidly as it has in the past, you know, let's say five to 10 years, because mugshots have been a fixture of law enforcement and criminal justice for, you know, uh, over a hundred years. But the, the simple fact remains that the automation of facial recognition, face recognition in law enforcement scenarios, it's taken a while to, to catch on and um, in, in a very automated way, um, many would argue. And, you know, fingerprints have been around since the, the 19th century, right? So the, the law and the science behind fingerprints and automated matching has come quite a ways. You know, there's standards, there's certifications for examiners. And a lot of those things just don't simply exist for face recognition. You don't have a Fry and Dobert standard for face recognition that makes it permissible in court. Uh, so, you know, I think over the next, let's say one, maybe two to five years, you're gonna see a lot of changes in that area, especially after we see more and more adoption of body cameras, body worn cameras where faces are gonna be collected um, and there's gonna be um, forensic analysis on events and uh, more automation, as Max mentioned, from, from mobile devices that have high definition images that can be collected on those cameras and processed in real time. So there's gonna be pressure on the criminal justice system to come up with those standards and, and to implement uh, rules and regulations to make sure that they're um, uh, consistently applied across the United States. And so, and that's gonna drive growth in the industry as well. We see in our own public safety business, a number of uh, police forces looking into the technology at the local level and the state level. So, and, and the, the FBI and other law enforcement entities at the federal level have had the face recognition technology for, for a long time. Uh, but at the state and local level, you're really gonna see a surge in the adoption and use of that technology, especially as the price points change. Right. And uh, Tim, can I get your take on the effect of consumer biometrics on law enforcement, please? Uh, uh, speed and accuracy are two things that are making law enforcement look towards face and iris. And in 2013, uh, uh, C just launched a pilot for face and then also iris. Uh, recently, they announced that the FACE system was no longer a pilot. IRIS will soon follow as a non-pilot pilot and, and a standard. But I think law enforcement has looked at um, some real successes like NYPD with facial recognition. But we've got a long way to go. You know, Be uh, Benji mentioned mugshots, and there is a, a real challenge. Uh, in law enforcement about how they go about collecting mugshots uh, versus fingerprints because there's really no uh, uh, ISO or NIST-based standard for quality assessment, automated quality assessment. There are some standards for that. We're going to see movement in that area 
uh, in the next year to two years that will make this automated identification much more accurate uh, than than what is happening today with respect to you know law enforcement for those additional modalities you know beyond the the fingerprinting like for Benjamin mentioned that's certainly well established uh, from a policy and a law perspective so policy has a lot to do with it and infrastructure and some of those things don't change too much uh, certainly the price of the technology to get fused face and iris has dropped dr dramatically in the past year and a half but it takes uh, it takes a while for that uh, to propagate through uh, the law enforcement community. But we're feeling it now. Can Great. I just Thanks, jump everyone. in? Yeah, oh, jump in. I just want to add to what, to what uh, Benji and Tim are saying. One of the issues has to do with the nature of law enforcement itself, right? Which is high, really high standards and slow technology transitions. The, the cycles in law enforcement are are very, very slow. So even though you're seeing changes because of the commercial technology and the improvements in technology to actually get that into the law enforcement technology life cycle uh is 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 just it takes time because it's just slow absolutely and i mean you know going off of that it's something something that's happened this year that i thought was very interesting just going off of what you said earlier about having fips level biometrics on smartphones is you're starting to see people from uh, or sorry uh, firms that usually work in public private partnerships actually release solutions for the consumer market so I think it is all yeah in that direction moving on um, to something that's kind of been in the news a lot lately um, election tampering it's still a very hot topic and i'm wondering if the case can be made for biometrics as a trusted voting solution and what obstacles are keeping biometrics from enhancing the electoral process in the united states and other established democracies and i'm going to ask uh, tim to start off with this please well peter um we recently did uh, an iris only uh, voting registration system in Somaliland, right? And it's uh, about 1.2 or 1.3 million people. And it was a single mode uh, application, which was iris only. Uh, in the US, boy, I think we're going to see some significant uh, privacy challenges with respect to that. Um, Max and I had touched on in the past, you know, this whole notion of uh, cloud-based uh, authentication versus, you know, personal verification. So privacy issues, I think, and, and policy are going to be a significant uh, inhibitor uh, to that domestically anyway. But uh, we're seeing an uptick uh certainly uh, with respect to voter registration not so much here in the u.s i think we're going to have a lot of challenges with respect to privacy people are be going to become desensitized uh certainly because of what they're seeing uh in the airport and border arena but uh i don't think it's going to be an overnight uh change by any stretch. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, Max, can you weigh in on this, please? Yeah, I do think it's interesting that in, in countries where there are real concerns about the integrity of voting systems across the globe, biometrics have been embraced um, to solve this problem. As Tim mentioned, uh, you know, we are so far away from that here in the US. And I also think, you know, probably in the UK and Australia and, and in, in Canada and places where we don't have national ID systems. There's, a, there's this tight correlation between obviously national IDs and voter registration, although it seems like it's very simple and one of the most effective privacy enhancing uses of biometrics, which is anonymous biometrics, where you're simply providing a biometric, whether it be, you know, 
face and iris, some combination of the two. I think fingerprints would be particularly hard in the US, but to decide whether you're in or you're out. In other words, you don't need any, you don't need to collect any other data about anybody. You can just simply say, okay, have you voted or have you not voted? So that works as far as the integrity of the actual voting system for you no know, duplication. Determining whether someone has the right to vote is a whole nother problem to solve. And again, in countries where you have national IDs, you don't really have that problem. It's something, you know, kind of unique to those countries who don't have it. Uh, so I think, you know, there's, you can solve parts of the problem pretty easily without violating privacy. But when you start talking about, you know, who has the right to vote, I think it's a much more complicated question. Completely. Um, we're we're slowly running out of time. I think this is going to end a little bit uh, later than than expected. We are getting a lot of questions in, but before we do that, I do want to have uh, one last question here. Um, how are advances in AI and mobility changing the use of biometrics in border control, law enforcement, and public safety as a whole? And Benji, can you start off on this one, please? Sure. Absolutely. Well. You know, AI has, you know, it's it's like any other trend in technology. It starts off slow and folks don't understand it. And then it starts to, to, to take off like wildfire. I think more and more you're going to see it influencing biometrics and biometric applications over the next several years. You know, for us, you know, when you talk about um, <clears throat> artificial intelligence and neural net learning, the, the, the most uh, visual impact that we've seen is the in increase or the enhancement in the, in the performance and accuracy of the algorithms. So we often see in the news um, a lot of discussions around privacy and racial bias and, and uh, concerns around that. And, um, you know, I think for the industry, one of the important things for everybody to remember is that testing methodologies for these algorithms are pretty rigorous. Companies like ours spend millions of dollars to, to enhance the algorithms and, and improve their accuracy and performance and decrease error rates and all that stuff. And, and AI is, is a function of that. Now that's on the testing methodology and the, and, the, and the development side. On the implementation side, you're going to see um, AI and and mobility have an impact on the adjacent uh, the adjacent data that's collected and and um, analyzed along with biometrics. So you're going to get a, a fuller picture of an individual to provide more insight for decision making and automation, quite frankly. So you know um, whether it's national security or or law enforcement, or or marketing and retail, um, you know, everybody is 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 picking up on the idea that when you have a lot of this data and you can automate more of it, you can deliver uh, more safety, uh, more convenience uh, to to either your your citizenry or your customers, and so you're going to see more of that happen. And there still will be some of the privacy concerns, but the questions around how do you develop that privacy framework for opting in or opting out when, when appropriate, those are going to be important. But there's no doubt that AI and mobility are going to be, play a big role in uh, influencing the technology of the future. Amazing. Thank you. So um, just to just to try and keep on st schedule here, we're going to go to some questions from the audience. I'm getting a lot in about um, government biometric databases, specifically focusing on heart. Uh, wanting to know, so just for, for people listening, uh, HART is a DHS large-scale biometrics uh, matching database, and uh, it's uh, there have been recent updates uh, about its progress. It's going to in incrementally add new modalities uh, as it goes. Face and iris are going to go live in 2020. Palm and eventually even DNA matching will be there when it's fully operational. These questions are sort of asking how that's going to affect um, biometric border control and law enforcement. Uh, Tim, can I get you to start off on this uh, audience question, please? Uh, well, uh, it's pretty simple answer that multimodal uh, has higher accuracy rate than single mode. Um, the probability of uh, fail to acquire uh, an image exists face, finger, iris. Um, so if you get uh, one or two out of three, uh, that's certainly something uh, that needs to be considered. Um, you know, at FedID, uh, Peter, there was a lot of uh, discussion about 
sharing data between IDENT, which is basically going to turn into HART, and uh, Department of Justice, which is CEGIS, and also DOD with respect to potentially derogatory information, um, which could be something as simple as somebody being wanted for something, and does one database respond to another? So a lot of that policy uh, that's behind that, we've got a long way to go uh, with respect to that. Um, on air exit, uh, you know, we participated in a couple of pilots that were multi-mode, and the decision that DHS made moving forward with uh, uh, air exit was, hey, we've already got the data for FACE, for these folks that are exiting, because we've got a passport photo, and that's what they're matching against. So in the future, you know, fingerprint, contactless fingerprint, and or iris, it's a reality that that's going to uh, come down the road. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, Max, can I get you to weigh in on that? Uh, I, that idea of large-scale multimodality and its effect on well, I want to jump in based on something that Tim just said because I think you know one of the issues we have here is you know Tim said oh well, we have this database of passport photos in the United States we have to be careful about that you know one of the reasons that our U.S. passports are not accepted for example in, in Europe's um, e-gate system is because we don't do live enrollment in this country our passports are only trusted if we go to, through global entry or TSA and we subduce live enrollments and submit background information. So I think there's some, some significant issues here, you know, moving forward with that. It does concern me to have, you know, a massively large database where we're collecting all this data. It's not subject to, pri to the US Privacy Act. So I think there's a lot we really need to understand about this and we need to um, be really careful. I mean, the US, FBI database has been pretty, you know, has been secure. We have really haven't had issues with that, but this is a whole nother level of um, data collection and and management. So I think there are issues with that, and I think there are issues with, you know, what how that's stored with biographic data. I personally believe you should never have biographic and biometric data co-located, particularly particularly in that kind of database. So I think there's some real discussion that needs to be to, needs to be happening about you know, going forward, what these databases look like, how they're managed, what the controls are, and also in the United States, if we're going to have credentials, you know, we're going to be using our biometrics, then we need to think about live enrollment so we can actually have confidence that the the images that we're collecting are connected to the identities that we're trying to authenticate. Completely. And Benji, I just, this is such a big question. Normally we would be moving on to other ones, but I just want to ask if you have yeah. anything to add to this. No, I have a lot to add. This is a huge question, right? So, um, so first off, let's, let's talk about the privacy and the legal aspects. I mean, all these large scale databases are subject to you know, privacy impact assessments. They have to be um, rigorously looked at from a policy perspective for, for risks and, 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 you know, you have to put those uh, PIAs out on the federal registry for public comment, and then they have to be revisited. So how are you using the data? How long do you keep the data? And that's just from a policy and privacy perspective. But, you know, I think the bigger question maybe we're all alluding to is how safe and secure are the databases from a cybersecurity perspective? That, that, that's something we should probably talk about and, and debate. But, you know, uh, to date, the, you know, I, there, there has not been a large data breach of all these databases that I'm aware of. Um, so they, they have been secure. Um, and, and the other thing we need to remember is, you know, a lot of this data that's being held in IDENT and will be held in HART, um, it's been collected the same way for 25 years. So there's, there's, you know, there's over, there's about 300 million, um, identities in there with, with 10 prints, but then there's also, um, every time an individual crosses a border, there's a photo taken, a foreign national. So, there's somewhere around the order of magnitude of four to 600 million face images for each transaction because it's a, you know, largely they record all the transactions in those databases. So there's a lot of data in there, not to mention all the passport data. So, but that's largely maintained by the U.S. Department of State and it's somewhat, it's a connected database, but it's not inside of IDENT per se. So there's a lot of complexity there and, and 
um, you know, the original question is how is it going to change the way that we uh, interact with hard and and what the services are. It, it has a lot of potential to be very sweeping change because what they're looking at, at doing is automating a lot of the interactions of those transactions of, of visitors to and from our country at every port of entry, whether that's not only airports, but also seaports and land ports. So it has a huge potential to help in things like visa overstays, looking for criminals, but also for passenger facilitation. So that's a huge question. We could probably have a whole panel hour on that one. Yeah, and that's actually probably a very good idea. Um, so before we keep everybody here for hours, um, I will move into one last uh, question. It's not a technology panel without uh, mention of blockchain. So I have an audience question here. Is there a role for blockchain technology to play in the trust associated, uh, associated with an identity? And I'm just going to leave this open to comment. Whoever wants to jump in here can. Well, I'll just briefly say, you know, yes, blockchain is a technology. Um, it has a role uh, in managing data, securely managing data, but it doesn't solve the problem of linking a digital identity to a human. So there's, when I look at those two things, I look at them as, I look at biometrics and blockchain as um, cooperative technology, technologies to help create even more secure identity infrastructures. Yeah, uh, Peter, I would say that blockchain ha certainly has a role uh, with maybe sharing uh, a biometric identity between uh, organizations, right? How that uh, pans out in the future, uh, maybe between countries and or agencies and or commercial entities, uh, I think it could have a role in that particular area. Yeah, I'll, I'll just I'll just I'll just finish the trio and agree. I, I, I think that technology is hugely uh, powerful, and I believe it's going to play a, a big initial role in the the fintech arena when it comes to biometrics and securing financial transactions. But I I, I definitely see that technology playing a huge transformative role as the architectures are built out. It's still, my understanding, it's fairly nascent, but I do believe it has a lot of uh, powerful applications. Excellent, thanks very much. Yeah, I definitely feel like there's a large foundational role for it in like a future infrastructure. So that's uh, excellent. Well, you know, uh, that takes us to the conclusion of our webinar today. I'd like to thank our expert panel again for joining me. Special thanks to Maxine Most and Acuity for providing today's research. Thank you again to our sponsors, NEC and Iris ID. Later this month, Fine Biometrics will be reporting live from Money 2020 in Las Vegas. If you're planning to attend, please reach out to us through our website or social media channels. Our next webinar, What Your Money Knows About You, AI, Biometrics, and Commerce, will take place November 7th. Watch your inboxes for an invitation. This concludes today's webinar presentation. From everyone at Fine Biometrics, have a great day.